harvest. <clears throat> bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, going forth with weeping, sowing for the master. Though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. <clears throat> he will bid us welcome, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing. <coughs> bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. How about a testimony? Barbara? During Jubilee, you mean? Yeah, the Harris boys. Uh, the girls at the choir or at the church, their their girls down there do that song. When they sing it, I can't get through it without crying. They have another song that they sing, and one of the girls does an alto part on it, and it's something about joy, joyful today or something. But the alto part steps down. You know how a bass part will step down on certain parts? And so I got to giggling the first time I heard it because I liked it, and she sang it so well. So she got after me afterwards. She said, you were laughing at me. I said, I was not laughing at you. So then when we went down for the banquet, they did the same song, and I was telling Carolyn about it, and she hit me right after the banquet, after the service, and said, you were laughing at me again. I said, no, I was not, J.D. How many of you know what J.D. means when I use it in that context? J.D. Sumner, stamps back for quartet, holds the record for the lowest bass note that's ever been hit. hit. And so I had to tell her the next Tuesday to look it up on YouTube and find J.D. Sumner. And she did. She says, now I know what you're talking about. Well, yeah. <laughs> but she does a good job. So I, I enjoy that song too. They do a great job. A lot of those songs on that CD are, are very, very good. Somebody else? Kathleen. Amen. Good. Somebody else? Louise. Well, that's what? Well, Kathleen tried to take me out to lunch since last October, and finally we had to do something on a Sunday afternoon to get out to lunch together, didn't we? Yeah. Amen. That's great. Nobody noticed my new eye eyeglasses. You know the big thing about those glasses? Free. Yeah. The VA. I went and he says, make a pair of glasses. You want me to give her a prescription? I said, well, what's the difference? She said, he says, well, if I make them, then you've got to go pay for them. If I make a pair, they don't cost you nothing. I said, I think you want to make me a pair. But they have the line bifocals. So if you see me f having trouble getting used to them, it, it's a different look from my variable lens bi bifocals. But for $400, I'll get used to them. Anybody else? 
All right, you two, you want to share with the class? Just kidding, Fred. Anybody else before we sing another song? I guess not. 356. Isabel will like this one. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly an end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burden alone. <clears throat> I must tell Jesus, Now think about the words that you're singing on this third verse. Look at them closely when we sing them. Ready? Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. 174. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee because Thou hast first loved me. And purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. 
I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. <clears throat> I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee in life. I will love thee in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and say when the death dew lies cold on my brow if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory, I'll ever adore thee in heaven. So bright, I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. And Bob has a special for us tonight. Pardon me, I'm a little raspy, but see if I can get through this. God, please bless America. Shield us by thy grace. May we turn to thee in humility as we seek thy face. God, please bless America. Grant thy favor grand. Oh, forgive our sin and cleanse within. Lord, please heal our land. God, please bless America. Help us in this hour. We believe the word of the living Lord. Save us by thy power. God, please bless America. Show to us thy care. We surrender all to thy great call. This our fervent prayer. God, please bless America, lead us in your way, ever leaning near for thy voice to hear as we seek and pray. God, please bless America, for thy glory bright, we will give you praise through all our days, God of truth and right. That's another Byron Fox song, by the way. I think we sang one this morning. Yes, we did. That's one we did. I don't know. Was it two years ago we did that every every service during the summer? Yeah. Yeah, it was, I think it was two years ago we used it as a theme song every Sunday morning. Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 4. And before the rest of you that uh, just heard me speak about looking at Revelation, turn me out tonight. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to stay with me because what we're going to talk about is mentioned here in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. The book of Revelation is a, sometimes, some people think it's a very difficult book to understand. Uh, and it, it, I guess it is in places if you want to dot every I and cross every T. But if you remember that God tells us everything we need to know and doesn't tell us everything just because we want to know it, 
Uh, it doesn't become that hard a book to understand. And besides, the book of Revelation always says and has always said, blessed is he that readeth this book. So we need to give it attention from time to time. We're not going to go through much of the book of Revelation as far as verse by verse. But in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, it says this. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I want you to think about what he says here. He says, After this. After this, there is an afterlife for the believer. There is life beyond death for the believer. Uh, you've heard said, many preachers have said, the day you read of my obituary in the newspaper, you need to be aware that I am more alive than I have ever been in my entire life. But there is an afterlife. After we die, there's more to come. The best is yet to come. We had a lady down at Fairview one time that had two sayings. She said, eat your dessert first because life's too short. And she also said, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. Well, tonight we want to talk about what happens after. Uh, last week I preached a message and it talked about things that happen quickly after Jesus comes. And this is part of that idea and concept. Uh, this is going to take place immediately when we see Jesus. And so we need to be thankful that God is, has an afterlife beyond this life here on earth for the born again, blood washed children of God. Uh, I'm glad that this world is not all there is. You've heard me say, and I still believe it true, that this world is the closest thing to hell we as believers will ever experience. But it's also the closest thing to heaven that lost folks will ever experience. All the good that they will ever have is now. What good there is in the world and what pleasure there is in sin for a season in the world, they get all of that now if that's their choice. But we understand that all those things that the world has to offer cannot compare to what's coming after this. So we think about it. We're born again. We're born on this earth in the flesh. We're born again in the spirit on this earth. But what about the hereafter? What about beyond the Christian life? But what about after this? And so we're going to talk about after this for a few moments tonight. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that we can go to your word and find encouragement for our souls. We're grateful that you tell us what we need to know. And many times, it's not so much that it makes any difference in what happens except for the fact that when we know what's coming up, it encourages us to know that you're in charge and you have a plan and your plan will never be turned aside. It will always come to fulfillment because of who you are. Thank you for your promises, always true. Thank you for the future that we're looking forward to. And I pray tonight that you would give us an encouragement spirit, help us to look forward with longing and anticipation to the afterlife. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I mentioned to you this morning that we went through that uh, exhibit up there, and they had <clears throat> part of the exhibit was what the Egyptians think about the afterlife. And I told you about that feather scale, and they believe that if you go to heaven that you float along this river, and so they pack all the stuff that you need to go. Well, in a Christian life, we don't have to pack anything. We make arrangements before we go by getting saved, but we don't have to pack a lunch. We don't have to pack servants. We don't have to pack riches because everything that we will need is going to be there waiting for us in this afterlife. I want you to look at that first verse with me for just a moment before we actually get into the heart of the message. He says, after this I looked. What's he talking about after? Well, he's talking about the end of the church age. If you remember the first, uh, first chapter of uh, Revelation talks mostly about the Lord Jesus Christ. The second and third chapter talk about the seven churches of Revelation. After those seven church ages, if they are indeed ages, take place. And we see Jesus in the clouds coming with great glory for his church. This is what takes place immediately after that point. This is not what takes place, what we're going to talk about tonight, on earth. We talked about that last week. But it's going to be what takes place as we enter to the afterlife in heaven. 
What, by the way, some of you who don't like boats and water, uh, you're not going to be getting in a boat and going to heaven uh, by a boat like the Egyptians saw it. Uh, we're going to be changed, the Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, and will be changed to be more like Jesus, to be like Jesus, and will be taken home to be with him. So what happens immediately after that? Somebody look up 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. <clears throat> Quickly, who's going to get it? Thank you, Frankie. Yeah, I knew you'd get there for anybody else. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Read that for me. So the very first thing that I mentioned to you this morning that uh, Fanny Crosby wants to see, when I see him face to face, then I'll sing the story saved by grace. The very first thing that we will want to see when we break through heaven's gate is not our parents who have gone before us, although we love them. It's not a loved one that's gone on before us, our husbands or our wives, although we love them and we miss them. The very first thing that we are going to want to see after that change into a glorified body is we will want to see the Lord. And that's the first thing we're going to mention tonight. We will see our Savior. And when you think about that, what a joy that's going to be. When we enter to heaven's gate, when we go through that gate, uh, it's, it's interesting that we have this idea and concept here on earth that Jesus is so special that we can't understand him. And in a lot of ways he is. Uh, I still can't explain fully the hypostatic union. I can't explain fully how he was all God like we talked about a few weeks back and yet he, he became as much human as he was God and he, he veiled himself in human flesh to the point that he had to learn as we talked about and grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, I can't explain all that to you but God knows exactly how it happened. But this verse says, when we see him, we'll be changed. We will be like him, and we will see him, and we will see him as he is. Not what somebody's concept is. How many times have you talked to people, and they've said something to the effect, well, now Jesus is so loving, he would never send anybody to hell. When we see him in heaven, we will see him as he is, not some misconception of Jesus. I get tired of these pictures where they have tried to portray Jesus, and it seems like they always want to make him as some little emancip emaciated, is that the right word? Ema emaciated, that's it. Emaciated, skinny, a weakling, sissified looking Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter by trade. Probably 30 years he worked in a carpenter shop. I picture him as maybe not being the most handsome man that ever walked the face of the earth, but I picture him as being a manly man with muscles because he had to use those muscles in the type of work he did. He was not a bean counter, although there's nothing wrong with being a bean counter. He was involved with physical, manual labor all of his life. What I'm saying is we're going to see him as he is. We're not going to see him even as we picture him. We're not going to see him as our parents pictured him or Aunt Susie or Uncle Bill pictured him. We're going to see him as he is. So it's a joy when you think about it that now we serve him and we see him with an eye of faith. But when this transpires, we're going to be in his presence and we're going to see him as he is. Uh, we, we need to think about this. In that verse... Uh, it says that, that uh, we, we are the sons of God. Read the verse for me again, Frankie. Now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear, If we're the sons of God, that means that we're special. Somebody told me I was very special this morning. And then in the next breath, they told me because I rode the short bus. Some of you know what the short bus is. It's for special ed students. Well, I'm special, but not because I rode the short bus, but because I am a child of the king. We are indeed, as you hear people give, and usually as an excuse, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, yes, you are. But that saved by grace part means you're also a child of the king of kings and lord of lords. And we need to live a life here on earth that shows that 
heritage and that birthright that we have now as Christians. We're sinners saved by grace into the family of God, which makes me a child of the king. We need to live that life because one day we're going to see in reality the type of life that we should have lived when we see him face to face. He's the one who was so beaten that when they hung him on the cross, the Bible says he was so abused that you couldn't even recognize him as a man. He's the one whose love kept him on that cross. Even when the father said, uh, turn his back, that Jesus had to say, oh my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God had turned away from him because of the weight and the burden of the sin of the world that he carried. We're going to see him face to face. We're going to see him, the one who was resurrected from a borrowed tomb. We're going to see him as the one who went up into the cloud. We're going to see him in perfection, a sight that we have never seen before. <clears throat> we sometimes think about that verse where it says, I have not seen, neither is ear heard, neither is entered in the heart of men, the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. It's going to be a joy unspeakable and full of joy, full of glory when we get to see Jesus face to face. Songs have been written about it, face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? Because we can't hardly imagine it. It's beyond the expectation that we will ever have. And let me throw this in, we won't be discouraged. I've met some people who I held in high esteem and thought they were something special and when I met them I realized they put their pants on one leg at a time just like I do. They weren't really all that special. But when we see Jesus, we're going to recognize he is as special as they come. We will not be disappointed. So when we get to heaven, when that beyond the Christian life takes place, when that after this takes place, we're going to see Jesus face to face. We should long for that. We should long for that. Uh, I can tell you right now, Isabel's going to go home tonight. And before she goes to bed, she's going to pick up a picture of Pat that sits beside her bed, and she's going to kiss it and long for him to be home. No, that's not how it's going to happen? Oh, I get it. But the truth is, do you want him home? Yeah. How much do we long to see Jesus face to face? Aren't we, you know, I, I just can't get this concept across to people. This should be our, one of our main heart's desires is to be in the presence of Jesus. If we can't be physically in his presence, we should want to be daily in his presence through the word of God and prayer and spending time as close to him as we can get now. How much do we love him? If we don't open that book, how, how are you ever going to think you're going to enjoy heaven in the presence of Jesus if you don't care whether you're around him now or not? We should love him now, want to be with him then, but spend as much time in any way that we can with him now, singing his praises, reading the word of God, praying, being with God's children, celebrating the resurrection every opportunity we have. We should never get tired of longing and that intense and constant feeling of wanting to see our Savior. So what happens beyond a Christian life? We're going to see Jesus face to face. Second thing that we have is found in Psalm 17 and verse 15. Mrs. Gilbert, you want to read that for us? Psalm 17 and verse 15. By the way, Angie was going to sing for us tonight. Years ago when she was a little girl, she used to sing publicly and she'd get so nervous that she'd almost pass out. We had to carry a paper bag to her so she could breathe into it and so she wouldn't hyperventilate and pass out and puke and other things. Uh, but we're glad that her and Jim are here with us tonight. If you haven't met them, they're adorable. They're sweet. They're loving. Uh, you can leave the check down. Did I get everything you told me to say, Jim? Okay. Carolyn, Psalm 17, verse 15. After this, beyond life, when we pass through this portal that we call death, we are going to find complete satisfaction when we're like Jesus. I don't know about you, I'm so dissatisfied with this life. And I don't mean just certain parts of it. I mean, I'm pretty much dissatisfied with the whole shooting match. Folks will say, well, how's your church going? And I want to be able to say, you know, it's going just super. I'm so glad it's going. But I tell them, I wish we were getting more folks saved. I wish I saw more folks growing. I wish we could give more money to missions. I'm dissatisfied. 
I guess that's part of the ministry is if you ever get satisfied, you know, you need, maybe need to go sell used cars or get in the insurance business or uh, uh, some other business and, and earn an honest living. If you ever have a preacher in this pulpit that's satisfied with the way everything's going, he has no vision, he has no drive, he has no zeal for the future because we've not arrived yet. But when we see Jesus, we're going to be in a place of complete satisfaction. The psalmist said, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. You know, one of the greatest things that I am dissatisfied here on earth is myself. Who's your worst enemy? Well, I'm old enough to realize this. Some people have still yet to realize it. I'm my worst enemy. If I live my life according to the word of God, does not matter what anybody else does to me, I can come out on top. But if I sabotage myself and get my feelings, as somebody thought they hurt my feelings this morning, and they did not, they just, it's hard for anybody to hurt my feelings. I don't get my feelings hurt easy. A lot of times I tell folks, uh, older, bigger, smarter, stronger people than you try to hurt my feelings, and they didn't succeed, so what makes you think you're going to? I don't get my feelings hurt easy. But the truth is, we need to be dissatisfied. I'm my worst enemy. Now, if I were to go up to you and say, you're your worst enemy, what would you say? Butch, what's one of Autumn's favorite sayings? Judge. Don't you judge me. And she says it jokingly. But people don't want people to, to get in their face and tell them, you're your own worst enemy. But I'm my own worst enemy. Now, maybe you're more spiritual than I am. I hope so. But when I look in that mirror in the morning as I shave and brush my teeth and comb my hair and get ready for my day, I realize that I'm the one that sets up myself for failure a whole lot more than anybody else. If Carolyn gets up in a bad mood and starts giving me bad, bad, bad vibes all day, I can respond to that in the flesh and become my own worst enemy. Or I can respond as Jesus would and win the victories. Now, I'm not saying you're bad if you get up in a bad mood. You understand what I'm saying? That old saying, what would Jesus do, is a good saying. If it starts being a reality with us instead of just a, a little cliche of some type. How would Jesus respond if you go to work and the guy that was supposed to open up messed up? How would Jesus respond if you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off? How would Jesus respond if uh, the, the income tax people call you and say, we're going to audit you? How would Jesus respond in anything that you're involved with that you find that you're your own worst enemy? How would Jesus handle it? And if you handle it like Jesus handled it, you're going to be victorious. I'm going to start this verse and you finish it. You should know it by now. If you don't, time to memorize it. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and... Oh, 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 oh. And nobody's got it. Okay, let's say it together. <clears throat> you ready? Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Is God's word true? When was the last time you were offended? Somebody treats you dirty. Somebody say something bad to you. You didn't like the way something turned out. You got your feelings hurt and offended. Can I tell you what the Bible says? You didn't love the law of God right. That's it. If, if I'm dead, I can't get offended. And that's what the Bible teaches. I'm supposed to die daily. And if I love the word of God and I'm obedient to the word of God, when somebody thinks they're offending me, they're not offending me. And you've heard me use this illustration. You've heard other preachers use it. A dead man, you can walk into a funeral home, go up in any casket, woman, child, uh, man, anybody that's in that casket and say anything you want to about them or their family or how they look or how they dress or how they act. And guess what? You're not going to get a rise out of them. And the Bible teaches us that in the flesh, we're supposed to be dying to self every day. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Yet, I, yet the life that I now live, I live by the power of God, or power of, I'm messing it up. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're supposed to die daily. And so we can't afford to be offended. If we're going to be changed and find satisfaction in heaven, we should start practicing that now. 
How do we get to that point now by applying the word of God? Now, I understand there's degrees of satisfaction in this life. I was talking to you this morning in the message, and I said, you ladies can remember when your children were born. They plopped them up on your belly, and you counted fingers and toesies and noses, right? Uh, Angie was born. I'm sure Carolyn plopped her up on her belly and said, uh, uh, 10 toes, uh, 11 fingers, and three noses. No, she said 10, 10, and 1. That was a good thing. That brought satisfaction, right? But then you remember what I said? What do you want to do when they become teenagers? Trade them in for a new model, right? So the truth is, there's levels of satisfaction. We become in the flesh satisfied about some things, but in the, in the long run, there's nothing on this earth that brings you eternal satisfaction. When we wake up in the presence of Jesus and we have glorified bodies, then the psalmist says, I am going to be satisfied. We get tired of the world we live in, don't we? Don't you get, I, I'm telling you, I'm so sick of politicians. I'm starting to believe I'm not a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or anything else. I want to become a, I wish they would start a conservative, biblical conservative party. I would join it, I think. Somebody that believed that the Constitution means what it says and just plain follow it. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the promises that President Trump has, has been said that he made, and I'm thinking that he made it, and I hope he did, he wants to have open carry or concealed carry across all 50 states. Right now, you know, if, if, as, as I do, I have a concealed carry permit, but if I carried a gun in Delaware, I'm going to get arrested. If I carry a gun in New Jersey and they find me, guess what? It'd be 10 years before you even know where I'm at, probably. That's how bad they are with it. And so... What gives us that state, what gives us that right is not the state. It's the federal constitution. I believe the constitution is my concealed carry permit. So, Republicans tell you one thing. Democrats tell you something else. Libertarian Party tells you something else. Greenpeace Party tells you something else. And in reality, they're all in it for the money. They're all in it for the power. They want to lift themselves up and gain the power and keep the power that they've gotten. We, we're not satisfied with that, are we? Are we satisfied when we see the, the, the downward trend and the openness of sin in our nation? Are we satisfied with that? Now, there are some things changing. You heard me say that the, birth, or the uh, uh, number of abortions have gone down in the last few years. That's a good thing. But by and large, our, our society is still going downhill at a fast pace. It's going farther and farther into the dregs of sin at a fast pace. We need to become so sick of it and dissatisfied with it and remembering that we're just pilgrims here and strangers here. Here's the reality. The Bible says it's going to get worse and worse. And that should not defeat those of us who know the Savior because guess what? Well, what did Nanny say? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. We're on a journey through this life to get to the afterlife, to get to where the Lord is. We don't have to become too worried about what takes place here. And then I think that when we get our glorified bodies, we're going to like them. I had this thought the other day. You know, I'm on a diet, lost a little weight, not near enough, hoping I can lose more. But the truth is, what if I get to heaven and in heaven everybody's fat? You hadn't thought about that, had you? Well, it don't make any difference, but I'm going to feel like I should have eaten more while I was down here, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Passed up all that good food, get to heaven, and everybody's fat anyway. Hey, right? My point is we're going to be so dissatisfied or should be with everything about this world that it should make us long for that next world when we are going to fit in like a hand in a glove. And, and I know you're, the, you're like me. I go places, even shopping. I go to the, the, the uh, mechanic. I do, go do things. I go to the VA. Most every place I go, I don't feel like I'm a part. I feel like I'm an odd man out, like I'm an oddball. Got done at the VA last Wednesday when I had my eyes checked. Went to checkout and uh, uh, got out to the checkout place, and me and a, a big black guy came together. He says, go ahead, go first. I said, well, I'm not really in any hurry. He says, neither am I. He says, how's your day going? I said, I'm blessed beyond belief. 
And he says, well, glory to God, so am I. We stood there in front of the checkout and almost had a revival. <laughs> Why? Because we were in an alien land, but we were brothers in Christ. Can you imagine when we get to our homeland, when we, we're, you know, we're, Ill or we're immigrants or we're illegal aliens or we're aliens to this land. Let's leave the immigrants out of it and the illegal part. We're aliens to this land. When we get to heaven, we're all going to speak the same language. We're all going to have the same idea about what's right and wrong. We're all going to love the same things. We're all going to be in love with Jesus more than ever before in the rest of our lives. What a joy it's going to be to wake up in heaven in his presence and feel completely satisfied. How, how do you feel after Christmas? You want me to tell you what most people actually honestly feel like after they've opened presents and everything's been done and you sit down Christmas afternoon? Do you ever have this thought, is that all there is? Yeah. Well, let me tell you what, when we wake up in heaven, we're not going to say, is that all there is? We're going to say, this is it. This is what I've longed for. This is what I've wanted to be. This is where I've wanted to be all the time I've been saved. This is what I've wanted to have. And then we'll have it in reality. We just see it in our eye of faith now. But then we're going to see it in reality. It won't be just an eye of faith. Then number three, think about this. We're going to be in a perfect environment. We, we have this misconception that man's going to save the world. All these uh, environmentalists, we call them, or some people call them tree huggers. I don't mean to be too offensive because I believe we ought to be somewhat of an environment, environmentalist also. Uh, I was raised as a young child. You didn't throw trash out of a car. It wasn't a political statement then. It was just right and wrong. It was wrong to litter, right? So we were taught some things when we were kids. It wasn't a, a national movement, but... This, this world, man's not going to tear this world completely apart. Who does it belong to? Did you ever walk on a neighbor's lawn? I wish I could remember his name. He lived next door to us down in Swan Meadows in Aberdeen. I was four years, three and four years old when we lived there. But he had pansies. Now, you remember I told you I was a lot like Connor. You never believed me, right? I would sneak over in his pansies. He had a whole backyard garden of them. And I'd pick a bunch of them, take them home to mama. I thought, this is going to make mommy happy. I come in with a whole fistful of pansies. Where'd you get those? Got them over there in the garden. Go next door, let's go. She'd take me over there. He was not happy. Can I remind you of something? We're walking on God's garden. This is his. I didn't plant those pansies. And when I messed them up, the next door neighbor would fix them up. My point is, this is not God's, uh, this is not man's garden. It belongs to God. I, I have this belief to the depths of my toes, man cannot destroy the environment of this land because it belongs to God. You walk on a next door neighbor's yard, it won't be long if you're leaving a footprint and you're leaving a, a, a path, he's going to make you stop walking on that yard. He's going to take care of his property. You take care of your property now that we're adults, don't we? Yeah. So guess what? If this is God's property, and it is, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, was, the word was with God and the word was God. In verse 2, it says, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. If he created it, it's his. It's his. And he's not going to let us ruin it. But when we wake up in heaven, <clears throat> when we pass over after this, the afterlife, the time when we're in the presence of our heavenly father, the environment is going to be perfect. What's one of my pet peeves here at the church? I go over this side of the room, some sweet, dear lady will say, it's too hot. I go in the middle of the room, some dear, sweet lady will say, it's too cold. I go on this side of the room, some dear, sweet lady will say, it's just right, I'm comfortable. What do I do? You want me to tell you a secret? 
Sometimes I go back there and open the thing and act like I'm going to change it and don't do a thing and come back to the pulpit. Oh, it's better in here now, Pastor. Haven't changed a thing. When we get to heaven, it's going to be a perfectly set temperature. Uh, they were arguing on, on TV this morning. What was today? Time change. Have you ever thought about it? When you get to heaven, there's not going to be any time change. There's not even going to be a morning and an evening of the first day and a morning and an evening of the second day because there's not going to be any evening or nighttime in heaven. Well, when are we going to sleep? I know some folks <clears throat> that are going to say to the Lord, Lord, I need a nap. That's one word going out of our vocabulary when we get to heaven. Not going to be any more naps. You'll be able to rest like you need to, I'm assuming. But it's going to be a perfect environment. Not going to be too hot, too cold. The Lord's going to be the, the light, so you're not going to be too much of one thing. Or, and I've thought about this. I've always said the ideal temperature for heaven would be 75 degrees, no wind, low humidity. Well, what if the ideal temperature for heaven for God is 10 below zero? It won't matter because I have a glorified body, right? It won't matter. God's going to take care of it. But that, that environment is going to be completely different. Uh, there's going to be a time when we're in heaven that everything will come about to make us understand that everything wrong and evil will never be there again. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more suffering. God's going to wipe away the tears, and guess what? It's going to be a perfect place to live. Has anybody in this room ever had a perfect place to live? It's funny I mean, we've lived in a couple of apartments when we lived in, in Texas and, and Oklahoma. And you go look at an apartment, you think, man, this is, this is just exactly what we need. And then you move in, and the neighbor upstairs is doing aerobics all hours of the night, keeping you awake. And the guy next door is smoking, and it's drifting through into your apartment, and you're gagging on the cigarette smoke. Or somebody's always taking your parking place out. You understand what I'm saying? We've never lived in a perfect place. But when I get to heaven, the environment's going to be perfect. Uh, let's just mention briefly that part in uh, uh, John chapter 14. I go and prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. What do you think you're going to have to do to your mansion? Lord, I, I wish that you would have put over on this wall that, that favorite portrait of my great, great, great. And Lord, I'd like to have a little plant. Don't you think he's putting it exactly like he knows you're going to want it and you're going to enjoy it? He's preparing a mansion. How can I prove that scripturally? Well, he prepared the Garden of Eden, which is saying you can't prove it scripturally. Listen, he prepared the Garden of Eden. You show me one verse where Adam and Eve complained about the temperature in the garden, the placement of the trees in the garden, what they had to eat in the garden till Satan tempted them and said, you, you really need that fruit. They didn't complain about the clothes they were wearing. They didn't complain about the animals in the garden, right? Because God made it for man. When we get to heaven, it's going to be even better than the Garden of Eden. So we understand that it's going to be a perfect environment. So not only do we have the concept of looking for that time when we'll be with Jesus and we'll find that perfect satisfaction, we'll have a perfect environment, but there's going to be a perfect city of magnificence like we cannot imagine. I made a statement, I think I told you this, I may not have. I made a statement uh, a couple of years ago in one of the classes down at the Bible College. We were talking about streets of gold. And I, I always try to be devil's advocate to the point that I make the kids think. And I asked them, do you think it's gold we're going to walk on in heaven? Well, that's what the Bible says. That was their pat answer. I said, well, let me ask you a question. What does gold look like on earth? The purest gold on earth that we have is 24 karat gold, as far as I know. Very soft metal, right? But it's not transparent. Even when melted, it's not transparent. But the Bible says the streets of gold are transparent as glass. My point was, the, the, the uh, vocabulary that the writer John was using to describe the streets of gold in heaven is limited to a human vocabulary. I don't know that it's going to be gold like we know here, but it's going to be a very, very precious substance. 
It's going to be gold as much as it can be to our imagination. The richest thing on earth is gold or platinum now, I guess. But it's going to be even better than what we have on earth that our imagination can't even put a word to it. What's it going to be like? Uh, do you know how big the city's going to be? The New Jerusalem measures 1,500 miles cubed. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, 1,500 miles high. Do you realize they did a study some years back? If God used the state of Texas to put every human being that ever lived on the face of the earth into the state of Texas, each person would have three square feet to stand in. You think about that. How many billions of people have lived since time began? You could still fit, fit every one of them and they would have their own three square feet, three by three square to stand up in or sit down in, in the state of Texas with room left over. And we're worrying about how God's going to fit us all into heaven? Uh-uh. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful city. Gates of pearl, walls of jasper, gemstones, everything that it used to describe it speaks of the beauty and the elegance of that city. And then number five, you on number five with me, Isabel? Oh, you're good tonight. Number five, we're going to see the, the, the saints that are waiting there for us. We, we have lost too many people out of this church to suit me. But who am I? God knows what he's doing. But when we get to heaven, there's going to be a grand reunion day. I'm thinking we're going to have a Safe Harbor Baptist Church homecoming day when we get to heaven. Uh, I counted one time, I think there were 12 women in our church that I preached funerals for their husbands. I don't know why the men don't seem to, Gene, you better leave while well, you got the chance. But the ratio has been much higher for men dying in our church than women. But when we get to heaven, all those dear departed friends are going to be there waiting for us. You know, we talk about how good it's going to be to see mamma, papa, aunts, and uncles. But there's going to be so many Bible characters there. It's going to be a fun million years, first million years, just getting to talk to Peter, James, John, you know, uh, talk to Moses. You know, Moses built the ark, right? And talk to Noah. Noah brought them out of the, across the Red Sea. Uh, it's going to, be, going to be interesting to find out the story firsthand about how all that took place. But those saints are going to be there. When? After this. You remember the verse we started with? After this, I looked. After this, he's called into heaven. After the church age, he's taken to heaven. When we go to heaven, we're going to see those people who have gone before us. What a day that's going to be. One more thing I'm going to mention, just going to mention it in passing. We're going to see angels in heaven. How many of you have ever seen an angel on earth? I know Edna saw something when one of her children passed, or she was sick or something, I forget the whole story. But she saw something, an angel or something, that, that talked to her about her child. I don't doubt that. The Bible says you need to be careful when you entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares. How many of you see me tonight? I know you're not going to believe this. The Bible calls me an angel. In the book of Revelation, I'm the angel to the church of Safe Harbor Baptist Church in Cockerville. The angels were the messengers of God. And in Revelation, it speaks about the pastors being the angels. But we're going to see the real angels. Isaiah saw them when he was high and lifted up. He saw the cher cherubims and the seraphims. And I'm sure that there are archangels. And there may be many, many, many other types of angels. Thousands upon thousands and scores upon scores of people or beings that we're going to see that we've never seen before. Uh, I've often wondered if angels are pictured on, in heaven, if they're like they are pictured. I don't really see where it talks too much. I can't remember time where it mentions angels' wings in the Word of God. Uh, there was one of the Christian movies that came out, and the angels were more like ninja fighters. And that could be they're in a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare. So that very well could be. I don't know exactly what they look like. I know they had wings and feet and things in Isaiah. If we saw one in reality sitting on your dining room table when you got home today, it might scare you to death. I do know that when angels appear, they always say, fear not, fear not, don't be afraid. 
because it probably scares to death. Uh, why were angels created? To what? Do you know what the book of Hebrews says? They're ministering spirits and they were created to minister to the saints. We talked about servants this morning. When we get to heaven, angels are going to minister or serve us. We're created for a time a little lower than angels, but when we get to heaven, we're the children of the king. And they're going to serve us just like they serve God. I don't know what that means. There's a lot we don't know about heaven. We're all going to be uh, rulers in heaven over something. I don't know what. Uh, maybe I'll be mayor of Cochranville for the millennial kingdom. I don't know. But it all happens after this. When we think about death, how do people think about that? Oh, my. Sorrow. Heaviness of spirit. When you think about your own death, your own mortality, uh, folks, I, you know, I, I don't know how to get, you, to get this across to you. I'm looking forward to being in heaven with Jesus. That does not make me suicidal. I'm looking forward to get on the bus if he's taking a bus load up, but I'm not going to walk in front of a bus load to hurry it up. You got the idea? We should want to be in heaven. But the other side of that coin is, Paul said, it's more expedient for me to be here with you. And for you, it's more expedient for you to be here telling others about Jesus. I was talking to Fran tonight, and she said that her, her granddaughter was there and didn't have anything to do tonight. I said, well, why don't you invite her to come to church? Well, she won't come. And I told her, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin to pray that your granddaughter will come to church with you if you keep inviting her. You don't think God can do that? If we're willing to do what we should, God will do what he can. We have to pray, believing, put feet to those prayers, and invite. We should be concerned. I don't want to go to heaven by myself. I want my whole family there. Not because we're going to have a, a father-daughter, father-son, father-wife relationship as we did here on earth. But I don't want them to spend eternity separated from God. I don't want them in a pit of hell. I want them in the glory of heaven. After this, let's just say you die this week. After this, who's left to tell your family? That's what I told Fran, and she threw another curveball at me. I said, I'm going to pray that they'll come to church, and I know they will someday because when you die and we have your funeral, I'll get to preach to them if I outlive her. She says, I don't want a funeral. <laughs> just be that way. I want a funeral. I want a closed casket funeral, but I want a funeral where some preacher stands up, hopefully at this pulpit, and preaches the word of God plainly and gives a clear-cut invitation and tries to get people saved. Then I want you to go next door and have a party. I don't want no funeral dirges sung at my uh, a funeral. I want songs like Victory in Jesus, Oh, Happy Day, all those good pick-me-up songs. Because listen, I'm not going to be sad. You guys are going to miss me terribly. I'm not going to miss you a bit. I'm going to be with Jesus. Me too. So we're just going to have a great time. After this, who's going to be here to tell your family about Jesus? We need to do it now. We need to do it now. The encouragement is that we want none of our family left behind. After this, it only gets better. Father, thank you for the time that we've had tonight. Looking at your word, talking about heaven, Lord, we long for it. This world is not our home. And sometimes, Lord, we're all guilty of putting down our roots too deep and being too concerned about all the trivial matters of stuff and lifestyle here on this earth when we need to be more concerned about living for you and living as if we were already in heaven. We are already citizens of heaven, so we should act like it. And may we take to heart this thought about after these things, after this, we will be in your presence. We pray in your name. Amen.